Thank, thank you, Peter. That's a new word. <laughs> Peter and I have had a lot of conversations over the years about language and performance, poetry and scholarship, and I've thought a lot about this. I've also noticed that a lot of readers of these books he mentioned will write and be moved or changed or conjured in some way, and they'll want to meet me. They will sometimes want to fly to Houston. And I always say, oh, that's a bad idea. That'll just ruin your impression of me. Um, so there, there is a distinction, I think, between the page and, and the lectern, and I, I hope I'm not here to disappoint you. What I want to talk about today is, in a word, the impossible. I want to suggest to you that what we consider impossible is not really impossible at all. It's simply a function of our own historical moment and what our culture has programmed us to believe about the way things really are and what is natural. In truth, the way things really are, I think, almost entirely escapes us. And what is natural is actually the supernatural. Two words. The most important piece of the title is the space between super and natural. I want to speak about this from my own training as a historian of religions. I was trained just six miles south of here with Peter at the University of Chicago. Um, I was trained to compare things across cultural and temporal boundaries, in particular religious phenomena, and especially very strange and extreme religious phenomena. I sense seriously strange things at work in the history of religions. Serious in the sense that I think these things challenge us to think anew about both consciousness and the physical cosmos. And strange in the sense that I do not think these strange things can be slotted into any religious or scientific model. I think these things are literally beyond belief and beyond reason. I also think we've been a bit dishonest uh, as a public culture now about power, the way power has functioned in these extreme experiences. We've, also, we've often resorted to uh, rhetorical techniques of dismissal, shaming, and distraction. And then we've confused these rhetorical techniques with explanations, and they're no such thing. One of the things I think we've tried to dismiss and distract ourselves from are the extraordinary exp expressions of power in particularly, again, extreme religious experiences. I'm thinking of things like near-death experiences, psychedelic experiences, mystical experiences. Scholars of religion have long known that such experiences often involve encounters with some kind of invisible energy, force, or power in the environment that is perceived to be as dangerous as it is sublime, as terrific as it is terrible. It is not at all clear if this power or force is objective, something out there, or subjective, something in here. Perhaps this is why individuals who get too close to such an energy or force by accident or by practice commonly develop extraordinary powers themselves they become empowered by the power, or they become what they have come to know. I know I'm speaking too abstractly here. So let me speak personally. Let me speak about a person, a person I happen to know quite well, a woman named Elizabeth Crone. Elizabeth lives in Houston. She grew up there. She's about my age. Um, and. 30, a little about 31 years ago in 1988, she was attending the yard site or the first anniversary of her grandfather's um, death at her Jewish synagogue, which happens to sit right across the street from my university. She got out of the car with her two-year-old little boy and was immediately struck by lightning. Elaborate near-death experience followed involving a glow in the sky a synesthetic garden, an invisible male presence, and a revelation of unconditional, absolute love. She returned, obviously, from this experience, and in the next few months as she healed, 
stranger and stranger things began to happen around her now empowered body. <clears throat> she received a phone call one night at 3 a.m. It turned out it was from her dead grandfather. As she spoke to her grandfather on the phone, her bedroom filled up with a white smoke and a red light appeared at the end of her hallway. Her husband, by the way, saw all of this as she spoke on the phone. She also began to have terrible nightmares, usually of plane crashes and tsunamis and earthquakes that would then play out on the next day's news. She became electrosensitive. She, she's, to this day, she cannot wear a Fitbit or anything electronic on her body. She can feel electricity in walls of homes. Light bulbs pop out when she's anxious or upset, and she can see strange glows of color around heads, your head in particular, if we stand in front of a white wall. Elizabeth is just one such prodigy. I have met or corresponded or sometimes worked for years with individuals just like her. I've come to the conclusion that we are vastly underestimating who or what we are. If there's one message I would like you to take away today, it is this. The human is not what we think it is, whatever we think it is. So how did we come to think of ourselves as so small? I want to try to answer this question, or at least begin to answer it for you, by invoking something I call the two bars. <coughs> My brother, who's actually here today, was once a high jumper. And so I was thinking of these two bars we can get over, a low bar and a high bar. I think we're all going to get, or many of us are going to get over the low bar. None of us are going to get over the high bar. The first bar comes down to the question of whether such experiences happen. For the sake of our conversation and thought experiment, I am asking you to entertain the possibility that they, in fact, do happen pretty much like they're described by people like Elizabeth. Please note, though, to get over this first bar, all you have to entertain is the fact that they happen. You don't have to say or believe anything about their origin or their nature or what they mean. All you have to do is listen to the stories and accept that these things happen. The second bar is much more difficult to get over. The second bar involves the question about what these events are. What is their origin? Where do they come from? What do they mean? What do they point toward? These are essentially questions, as I'll try to suggest, about the relationship between the mind or human consciousness and matter, including the matter of the brain and the body. Again, I know I'm speaking in abstractions, so allow me three stories that I think illustrate these ideas really well. Story one, Samuel had a dream. He dreamt of his brother lying in a metal coffin in a suit of Samuel's. There was a bouquet on his brother's chest, a ring of mostly white flowers with a single red flower in the middle. The dream was so real and so convincing that when Samuel awoke, he got dressed to go down to the funeral home to uh, look at his brother's body. Until he realized, of course, it was just a dream. Except it wasn't. Two weeks later, his brother, Henry, was killed in a freak work accident. When Samuel arrived at the funeral home, he saw his dream played out in perfect detail. There was Henry's body in a metal casket, wearing a suit he had borrowed from Samuel without him knowing. Only one detail was missing. As Samuel sat there and watched, a woman walked in with a bouquet of flowers, mostly white, with a red one in the middle, and laid it on Henry's chest. Okay, that's story one. Story two takes place in May of 19, oh, here's, Here's the image I was supposed to show you. Story two takes place in May of 1959. It involves a teenager named Barbara. Barbara was on a skiing trip 
in Northern California. On the way home in their beat up Volkswagen, these kids stopped in a little town called Lone Pine. This is actually a photo of Lone Pine, I think sometime in the 1950s. Barbara got up in the morning. She had to pee, of course, looking for a, a bathroom like we all would. And as she walked through this little town, something extraordinary happened. It burst, this is her language now, it burst into living flame. Everything became alive. Even the teacups and toasters in a shop window glowed with a kind of blinding mind or life. Then it took her. She could not quite say what took her. She describes it as an invisible flock of angels that mauled her, that savaged her, and left her for dead. Here again you can see this theme of the sacred is dangerous and is sublime. Later she would speculate that what she encountered was a kind of invisible species in the environment, perhaps something non-carbon based, something super evolved that seeks us out. She also wrote of her earlier experience of what she calls fissures in reality, a rent in the fabric of space-time. And she writes of that force or power or energy. Again, just a classical description of what we mean by uh, the sacred. Story three. Kerry had driven a long way to his cabin in Northern California. He got there around midnight and had to pee. Seems like a theme, doesn't it? Uh, I better stop drinking my water. Uh, um, but this is the story. I mean, this is, this is actually key to the story. So he, he gets to his cabin. He's got to pee. The outhouse is about 50 feet down, uh, down this path uh, to, from his cabin. And so he gets his big black flashlight, and he goes walking down to the cabin. And he sees something glowing. And he shines his um, flashlight on this glow. And um, there's no other way to put it. What he sees is a glowing raccoon. Worse yet, the glowing raccoon looks at him and says in perfect English, good evening, doctor. That was the last thing Carrie remembered. Six hours later, he finds himself walking down a road toward his cabin. The sun is coming up. His clothes are perfectly dry, despite the fact that it's very wet and humid in the evenings in that part of California. A few weeks later, Carrie was in a bookstore in La Jolla. This book had just come out. It's 1987. He picks up Strieber's communion and recognizes immediately his own experience in Strieber's. A few hours later, he's at home reading Strieber's book, and his daughter calls, Luis, and his daughter says, Dad, I want you to read a book. She wanted him to read Strieber's communion. She said, this happened to me on our cabin property a few years ago. I've never told you. Um, she was gone for three hours while her fiancé searched the property screaming for her. Okay, so those are the, these are three stories. There are thousands, if not ten thousands, if not millions of these floating around. I'm, I'm sure there are stories like this in the room here today. What do we do with them? Well, the first thing you might want to know is who these crazy people were. Samuel was Samuel Clemens, otherwise known as Mark Twain. Twain, in fact, was absolutely fascinated with what we today call the paranormal. He referred to it as mental telegraphy. One of the interesting things about the paranormal is it tends to track the history of technology. People are always invoking the technology of the time to explain it. Uh, Twain actually wrote two essays on his life of these sorts of experiences, both with mental telegraphy in the title. And what's interesting about Twain is he linked these experiences to his own literary creative process. He did not see these as tangential. He thought that they were absolutely core. Barbara is Barbara Ehrenreich. Uh, the well-known social feminist critic, famous for books like Nickeled and Dimed. Uh, and Carrie is Carrie Mullis, the biologist who won the Nobel Prize 
for genetics in 1993 for inventing the polymerase chain reaction, otherwise called the PCR process. So let me just be blunt for just a moment before I move on and, and uh, become a little nicer. It's never been true, and it never will be true, that these sorts of things happen to only people who don't know their science or who are not sufficiently educated. These things happen to all sorts of people from all walks of life. And I'll talk a bit more about why these particular intellectuals waited so long to tell their stories. But I think what's really at work here is a kind of cultural suppression of the stories and not of the experiences themselves. In the meantime, I want to paint on a broader canvas for you. Um, I want to paint on the canvas of the history of religions. And again, by this, I don't mean today or your religion or your religion. I mean all religion looking as far back as we can see in human history. I want to suggest to you a simple model of religion that answers the question of why people believe strange things. A lot of my skeptical or scientific colleagues believe people believe strange things because they're superstitious or they're foolish or they don't know their science or they don't understand statistics or probability. I'm sure sometimes that is true, but I assure you that that is not how these beliefs originated and it's not how they developed. I want to suggest to you that people believe strange things because strange things happen to people. It's really that simple. People do not develop doctrines of the soul, some kind of essence that can separate from the body because they're foolish or because they're afraid of death. They develop these beliefs because they experience themselves leaving the body and floating above the body in accident and illness and today a war and car accident and surgery. Cultures do not believe in reincarnation because, again, they're afraid of death or it's simply because what their cultures told them. They develop these ideas because small children commonly report previous lives in great detail, often detail that can be um, followed up on. And they do this, by the way, not just in cultures that believe in reincarnation, but in cultures that find reincarnation horrendous or offensive or impossible. Here's a test for you. Who of us in this room, if Henry were our brother and Twain's dream were our dream, who of you would not believe like Mark Twain did in the reality of precognitive dreams? I certainly would. I suspect you would too. So this, I think, is why these beliefs develop. And we would be in some very good company. Indeed, this is the cultural global norm. This is the historical average. Our present secular skeptical attitude toward these things is a wild, wild historical anomaly. I can show you, for example, rattling or dragging chains in Victorian ghost stories, the 19th and 20th century. But I can also show you rattling, dragging chains in a medieval Chinese Buddhist scriptural text. Moreover, the rattling chains signal the exact same thing in both cultural contexts. They signal the dead being upset or angry for some particular reason. The cultural context, of course, changes dramatically. I can think of no two different religious traditions than Victorian Protestantism and medieval Chinese Mahayana Buddhism. Let me then focus also on a single religious tradition and show you how things not only stay the same, but they also change. They change in the way we think about them. Here are five terms all within a single cultural matrix, which we might call European Christianity. I want to say a bit about each of these words until I move into two more stories that are even more impossible than the ones I've already told you. The supernatural, one word, was coined in the 13th century. It has not always been around. It was coined for legal reasons. The Catholic Church is the only tradition I know of that puts its saints on trial. It literally developed a legal process to determine whether this or that person was a true saint. 
and they would assign a lawyer to each side. This is where we get the phrase, the devil's advocate. This was the lawyer assigned to the case to shoot it down. This all started in the 13th century. The supernatural was set, was set against the preternatural. The supernatural refers to any kind of event whose agency lies in the divine or God outside the natural world. The preternatural refers to any event or any marvel or prodigy that occurs within the world that's part of the natural world and does not have any kind of divine or supernatural agency. Let me give you an example. Take Francis of Assisi. Francis, as you may know, bled profusely from the palms and the feet and the side. You can actually go to Assisi to this day and see the bloody socks held uh, from when he... Um, well, he died basically partly from these wounds. The tradition believes that he got these wounds in imitation of Christ and that they came from a kind of glowing angel in the sky that sort of radiated him with these, these wounds. Other Christians, particularly Orthodox Christians, often argue that these were in fact psychosomatic, that they were a kind of mental illness or that they were from the devil. Okay, so just because something's marvelous or extraordinary, that's bar one, you know, it happened. But bar two is, what does it mean? And even within, particularly within Christianity, these things have been debated endlessly. The supernormal and the paranormal are much later. These are 19th and early 20th century coinages. The supernormal was, I don't know if it's coined, but certainly brought into use in the 1880s by a Cambridge-trained classicist named Frederick Myers, and it referred to these same sorts of extraordinary abilities, abilities like telepathy, which Myers did coin, um, that Myers felt were not supernatural but were part of the natural world. He, he, he really placed them in an evolutionary context and thought that they represented the future to which we were evolving. The paranormal worked a lot like this. It was coined in 1903 by a um, lawyer and medical doctor named Joseph Maxwell in, in France. It's French, le paranormal. Uh, and it's essentially a French riff on the supernormal, and it essentially means the same thing. I've tried to gloss the paranormal today as the supernatural. Again, two words to capture what, what's happened. All right, again, no ab let's move from abstractions to case studies. If you thought these earlier stories were weird, get ready. Um, these are completely outrageous. These two, I'm gonna tell you two stories. Uh, both of them are about human levitation, okay? Human levitation is really interesting. If you're talking about a precognitive dream or the apparition of a dead loved one, the only person who has it is Twain or another loved one. It cannot be witnessed by anyone. Not so human levitation. Levitation is interesting in that if it happens, which is our first bar, anybody can see it. If I start to float off the floor here, you'll see it. Uh, I, I won't, but if I did. Um, so we actually have, an, there are about 100 to 150 cases of this in the historical records, believe it or not. It's actually very well attested. Easily our most uh, attested case is this man here, Joseph of Cupertino, whose dates are 1603 to 1663. Joseph grew up in abject poverty. He was literally born in a stable. His mother was fleeing from debt collectors. His dad was taking refuge in a church from the same debt collectors. His first four siblings all died in childhood. By the time Joseph was seven, he had a huge tumor about the size of a melon on his back that left him bedridden for five years. A wandering hermit came by and cut the tumor off with a cauterized knife when he was 13 and he finally got out of bed. By the time he got out of bed, though, his uh, friends all called him bocca aperta, which is Italian for gaping mouth, because he just kind of you know, stare at the sky with his mouth open. He was, he was dissociative. He would, he would enter these trance states just at the drop of a hat. 
By the time he was in his late 20s, he had been ordained a priest in the Franciscan order, and he was manifesting extraordinary supernormal abilities, as Myers would say. He read minds, he could control the weather, he would float, he would fly, and he didn't do this by choice. He would see something religious and he would scream and then he would like fly up into a tree or into a statue and they had to get a ladder to get him down. <laughs> this happened so many times that the church got ner really nervous about this. You don't want people flying around your church. And they moved him all around Italy and basically in a kind of house arrest and surveillance for his rest of his life, 35 years of this, he was essentially hidden in house to house to monastery to monastery to avoid the crowds who did things like take tiles off a roof and dig through walls and anything they could do to get to this guy. The reality of Joseph's flights was never in question. People saw them. We have 150 sworn testimonies of people who witnessed this firsthand, sworn on the state of their eternal soul. Now, that may not mean much to us today, but that, mean a, that meant a lot in 17th century Italy. Okay? The question was, again, what do these flights mean? Were they from God or were they from the devil? Daniel's last levitation was on his deathbed and was reported by his surgeon. As the surgeon cut open his right leg, Daniel floated, I'm sorry, not Daniel, Joseph floated gently off the operating table. Okay. Second case, Daniel Douglas whom? Daniel's dates are 1833 to 1886. How different the career of Daniel than Joseph. Daniel Lamont, whom's biographer calls Daniel the first psychic because a very famous chemist of the day, Sir William Crookes, uh, investigated whom at great length and coined the phrase new psychic force. This is where we get the word psychic, not from the tabloids, but from a chemist, a British chemist named Sir William Crookes. Lamont also calls Daniel the most interesting person who ever lived well before the beer commercial. <laughs> Daniel's abilities began when he was 13. His first exper experience was that he saw a playmate appear as a luminous cloud in his room at night. He knew he, the, the, the childhood friend had just died. At 17, he had the same experience of his mother who um, Daniel was in actually uh, the U.S. and his mother had died in Scotland. By 18, multiple poltergeist effects would happen around him. Things would fly, furniture would move. His aunt with whom he lived was so upset by this that he, she kicked Daniel out of the house because she thought of this as the work again of the devil. As you might notice, the devil is the scapegoat for virtually everything here. He did levitate. Levitation was not as common with Daniel as it was with Joseph, but his most famous levitation, which is recreated here in this woodcut, appeared before three people, including Lord Lindsay, who would become the president of the Royal Astronomical Society and a fellow of the Royal Society. So again, we're not talking about naive witnesses. We're talking about the scientific elite of the day. Joseph could also produce ghostly hands that could shake a hand, another human hand. He could play musical instruments without touching them, something witnessed by none other than Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-founder of evolutionary biology with Darwin. He could elongate his body, sometimes up to 12 inches. He could move furniture with his mind, sometimes with five men standing on a table to try to prevent it from moving. He could shake walls. He could levitate up to ceilings. E.B. Tyler, one of the anthropologists of religion of the day, wrote an essay called, Is Mr. D.D. Womb Home a Werewolf? And the Pope called him down to Rome only to expel him from the city for being a sorcerer. So what's my point? My point, I have two points. My first point is that paranormal phenomena are remarkably stable across temporal periods and in cultures. Joseph was embarrassed by his screaming flights. He lived in holy poverty, and he was exceedingly pious. 
Daniel was a famous performer, enjoyed prestige and fine things, and was chased out of Rome by the Pope. My second point is that the powers themselves do not constitute what they come to mean. Joseph of Cupertino, the flying saint, is still a saint. Very few people in this room have even heard of Daniel Douglas Hume. Okay? The first psychic was erased from history. The flying saint remains part of history. Also, let me observe that we do see a shift from the outside to the inside here. In Joseph's case, the levitations were accepted because it was believed that they came from God, that they were supernatural. In Daniel's case, they were rejected as hoaxes because they did not come from God. They came from within Daniel. Let me just say a few words about why I think we find this so hard to consider, and then I'll conclude. I think there are five reasons. I'm just going to touch on these, but you can go to the books if you want more. First of all, I think there's a real politics of knowledge at work here. Michel Foucault wrote that all forms of knowledge are also forms of power. By that, he meant that all forms of knowledge occur in institutions that allow you to say and think and imagine certain things and don't allow you to say or think other things. This was as true in Joseph's case with the Roman Catholic Church as it is today with the secular academy. Also, I didn't tell you, but Mark Twain, Barbara Ehrenreich, Kerry Mullis, and Elizabeth Crone all refused to talk or write about their experiences until it was safe. The traumatic secret, this is a big one for me. If you were to ask me what I think the number one trigger point is for a paranormal event, I would not hesitate to say trauma. Robust paranormal phenomena do not happen on call. They cannot be invoked in a scientific laboratory. The, the critique that uh, these people don't win the stock market is silly because there's no trauma involved. They occur in illness. They occur in near death. They occur in death. You need those things to, to trigger them. They do not behave is just another way of, of saying this. I think trying to push these things into a scientific method is like going to the North Pole to prove the existence of zebras. You're not going to find zebras at the North Pole. You've got to go to Africa. You've got to go where zebras live. And it's the same with this stuff. You have to go to human lives and human suffering to find these things. Finally, there's the nature of meaning and the imagination. By meaning, I simply mean these things sit most comfortably in the humanities. Meaning is our gig. It's not a scientific category. These things are about story and comfort and consolation and love and connection. They are not about mechanisms or mathematics or causes. And finally, the Baroque religious imagination. What do we do with a talking, glowing raccoon? I'll tell you what Carrie Mullis did. Carrie said very clearly, I think it's some kind of projected hologram by which he meant he had encountered something very real, but he didn't believe for a moment the visionary uh, content of what was going on. And I think we need some kind of sophistication like that. Let me also just say, I want to trouble your understandings or your assumptions about the trick and the truth. There are frauds here, there are fakes, but there's some deep, deep relationship between the frauds and the fakes and the real thing. Consider the placebo in modern medicine or the pharmaceutical industry. The placebo is a fake. It is a fraud. It is a trick. And it works. It works about 30% of the time in many pharmaceutical trials. There's something about human beings that need to be tricked into our abilities or our healing powers. I'm going to skip this one and move right to the end. So where does this leave us, and what can we say? I, I really want to just say three things here. The first is that I believe that our conclusions follow from our exclusions. And what I mean by that is the way we think about the human or the way we think about ourselves is largely a function of what we refuse to look at and what we take off the table. If we take 
or if we put back onto the table the stuff that we've taken off the table, we will come to very different conclusions about what a human being is and what we are doing here. The Flip is a little book I wrote about scientists and engineers and medical professionals who begin with some kind of conventional materialistic worldview. They believe that all there is is matter until they have one of these experiences. They fl and then they flip. They realize that mind is not just mattered, but that matter is also minded. That there's something about consciousness or mind that is fundamental and not just uh, a, a product of brain process. They also realize, and this is just as important, that none of their science or technology has to change a whit. It all works just fine. Materialism was just an interpretation. And it was half true. It worked just fine. The future of knowledge, I think, will rely not just in the flip, but in some kind of integration of mind and matter, some kind of integration of consciousness and cosmos, some kind of integration of the objective material world that the sciences study and the subjective worlds of meaning that humanists study. I think we're going to have to get over the first bar and we're going to have to start speculating about the second bar. I know we're not there yet, not even close. But as I hope I have shown you today, there are signs all around us, impossible signs that are impossible, not because of what they speak, but of what we can presently hear. That is enough for now. I know you have questions, so do I. May the force be with you. <laughs> okay, so I think we're going to do a Q&A, but I, I, I'm not going to moderate, Eric. You are? Okay. So love to answer your questions. That assumes I have answers. Um, I may not, and if I don't, I'll tell you. Yeah, here's Oprah. Thank you. That was uh, that was excellent. Uh, the question I have uh, relates to your description of the characteristics of these occurrences, these outside of normal occurrences, and you uh, indicated that the traumatic effect is something that is required. In some of the examples you gave, um, uh, there had been no traumatic effect or cause and effect. Uh, for example, when uh, Twain's brother died, he had the, uh, the vision bef before that, so there was no traumatic effect. Well, I would say there was. I, I would say that consciousness is not located strictly in time. Oh, and that, even better. Yeah, and <laughs> that, you know, that what, I mean, that's what precognition implies, right? that we have access to information not in the present and not in the past, but in the future. I don't know how anyone else to read that. Uh, and notice for that information to, to flow backwards required a very severe trauma. It required the death of, of Twain's brother, Henry, who was, by the way, killed in a boiler accident on a riverboat. I, I didn't want to give, all, give away all the details because you'd figure out who it was, but that's what happened. I thought you, can I just say one more thing? I thought you were gonna talk about Daniel, and it's not clear if there's any trauma in his case. Um, there was another one, yes, I was gonna yeah, brought him up. I, I'm not talking about rules or, or laws here, I'm talking about really strong patterns, and I think trauma is an extremely strong pattern, but I would never say that it's absolutely required. There's, there are some people, there are Michael Jordans of the paranormal world, they're just insanely gifted. And we don't know why. Human abilities are not evenly distributed, whatever those skill sets are. And I don't, I don't think these, these, these are any different. Yeah. In view of your work, would you speculate as to what you think causes is the second bar, the cause for these paranormal activities? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I've written a lot about that question because I do think we need to speculate um, to get anywhere. I, I think it all comes down to the nature of consciousness, frankly. 
And the model we've been working with with consciousness is that it's just sort of a tangential or epiphenomenal production of the brain. And when the brain goes out, consciousness goes out like a blip. I suspect something reverse is true, that consciousness precedes the brain and the body, and the brain is a kind of iPhone that can translate the signal into a person, but in fact it's not at all located in the brain or the body. And I, I think that's what I would say a lot of these power, these aren't, you know, powers or much less superpowers assume that, you know, somehow it's, it's the person who has this power, this ability and can use it at will. I don't think that works like that at all. I think these are more examples of when through trauma the brain is somehow shut down or compromised, other parts of the world come pouring in and they manifest as these kinds of experiences. So I think we need a different model of the relationship between mind and brain to make sense of these things. That would be my, my general answer. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you. Great um, <clears throat> uh, uh, education that you're giving us. So um, on the topic of the future of knowledge and the blending of the two, right? Like our, the two sides. For widespread maybe acceptance of this, I, I wonder if like the concept of like, is this of benefit to mankind to accept this type of thing? Is there a benefit that would help ease the, you know, blending of the, I, the two? I th absolutely, you know, <laughs> one of the things I do when I lecture at universities, it's usually to other humanists and I, I tell them, you know, I've discovered the secret of all truth in the humanities and I ask them if they want to hear it. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. Here's, the, here's the secret. The truth must be depressing. Okay? And they all laugh. You guys aren't humanists. They, they, they laugh hysterically at that one because they know it's true that if they say something depressing, they will be considered smart or they'll get promoted or they'll get you know, tenure or whatever. But if they say something positive or much less cosmic, which is what I'm saying, they'll be called a dilettante, they'll be called new agey, they'll be called all kinds of names, and their careers will be in jeopardy. So my own feeling to answer your question is that we've, the humanities have sort of dug their own grave here um, by deconstructing everything into a kind of mush and, and giving the world a series of pretty depressing claims, and that we need to start climbing out of that hole we've dug and start reconstructing a view of the human that is much more positive, if not actually cosmic. And I think that would be heard in a way that, are, that, that, that were not heard uh, in the present. So I think it ha would have tremendous impact, but long range and in very indirect ways. I'm not, I'm not suggesting any kind of simple you know, silver bullet here. Um, but yeah, I, I think a positive view, a cosmic view of the human would have tremendous positive impact on, on everything. But it would also, please note, challenge other things. I think there's, this is a kind of a two-edged sword. My, my talk today was in some ways very friendly to religion, but in other ways very critical of religion. Because the religions shut these things down just, just like secular intellectuals do. They just do it in a different way. And these abilities are not restricted to any religion. They're, they're universal, they're human, they're not Christian or Buddhist or Hindu or anything else. So um, to expand upon a point that you were making during the previous question um, about how these things function within the brain, mm -hmm. do you think that... I don't think, yeah, but I don't necessarily think or, they're, they're within the brain. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, you slipped, you, you think, slipped into a, a conventional yes. model there. Okay. <laughs> um, but do you think that people that haven't experienced these things or haven't experienced a trauma that would open them to these things, can we tap into it? Yeah, I see that's, I get that question a lot. It's a tough question. It's a great question. I think a lot of uh, religious techniques are essentially designed to traumatize the person in some way. Um, <laughs> You know, meditating on the crucified Christ, for example, is meditating on a trauma. Uh, trying to shut down all thought or all imagination in a kind of Zen practice is a kind of 
shutting down of the brain. So I think a lot of practices are designed to do this in a friendlier, more gentle way. But honestly, I think it's really hard. I, I think there is a sense in which you have to have the experience to be convinced of what I'm saying. You know, um, so one of the other things I would say is, I think elite intellectuals and scientists, by which I mean people like Twain and Ehrenreich and Mullis, need to stop waiting until the end of their careers to say these things. We, people need to step out from behind the curtain and start speaking honestly about this. I don't think we are yet. People are hiding. People are in the closet. You know, I, I, I've lectured on this, you know, maybe 50, 60 times at universities all over the US and Europe, and people always ask me, well, how do you deal with the, the pushback? And I always say, what pushback? I don't get any pushback. Intellectuals know this is the case, particularly anthropologists who, you know, have lived in some other culture and some really weird thing happened to them, but they're in the closet. And so when some fool like myself comes along and just starts talking about them openly, they're like, oh, so that's how you do it. You know, that's how I can talk and not be accused of being a tabloid or a new ager or, or a dilettante. And I think that's what intellectuals and poets, frankly, should be doing is forging languages so that cultural elites can start talking about these things in the public. And, and once we do that, that will then authorize other people to step forward, and pretty soon we'll have a different culture. That's the model. So I found the slide that you skipped over very visually interesting, and I wondered if you could say something about it very briefly. Sure. Because otherwise it's going to bother me all day. <laughs> sure. Sure, here's the slide. It's, it's a, it was a reference to William James, the, the great philosopher and psychologist, who was also an avid researcher of mediums and seances, by the way. And let, let me just use that. I was trained six, again, six, six miles from here with Peter. We all read William James' Varieties of Religious Experience. Nobody ever told us that William James was a psychical researcher. No one. So we just kind of cut that off and just went, went forward. So what James said, he said this. He said, it only takes one white crow to prove that all crows are not black. So yes, there are lots of frauds. There are a lot of fakes. But proving this or that is a fake or a fraud really says nothing about the genuine or authentic cases. And for James, there, were not, there was not just one white crow. There were thousands and thousands of white crows flying around. Crows are not all black to speak metaphorically. Lots of hands. It's one of the problems is, is that our physics is more inadequate than physicists like to acknowledge. So the flip is, the, the flip is largely came out of about a 10 year conversation with lots of physicists about what it is they do. Um, I find physicists fascinating. I mean, it depends on the physicists, of course. But certainly the physicists I talk to, they're, they're fascinating for two reasons. One is their whole profession is about telling us that reality isn't what we think it is. So there's a kind of inherent religious or spiritual dimension to what they do. They also, if you talk to them long enough, you realize that physics tells us absolutely nothing about what matter is. It only, only tells us about what matter does. They can give us mathematical formulas to predict the behavior of matter to many, many decimal points. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But they will tell you, we have no idea what matter is. That, kind, that metaphysical question is completely beyond physics. So when a physicist starts to tell us what matter is, that we can be assured that he's, he or she has stepped away from physics proper and is now speculating, which is fine. Um, and if you push these physicists further, at least the ones I talk to, what they really think is that matter is somehow, um, mathematics as well, is somehow an expression of some kind of mind. You know, they, they really land on a kind of panpsychism, as we call it, a, a position that everything is minded in some way. 
And by they, I just mean the ones I've been talking to. Of course, there are lots of physicists who would call all this crazy talk and uh, don't listen to a professor of religion about anything. You know, that's the power move. That's Foucault again. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. You kind of addressed it. You said, you know, if more intellectuals and academics could actually talk about their experiences, then this would be more open. And how I want to unpack that is that um, there is scientific research, and there's a ton. I've read a few places, like there's a book by Dean Radin on real magic. And good research will just be rejected from a, a journal. Or, and I read elsewhere that uh, Ryan's work, you know, the, the research on parapsychology has more statistical validity than the stuff that supports the use of aspirin. Right. So I just wanted you to right. comment on why you think this is such a potent psychological or social psychological thing in the academy. So I know Dean, Raiden, I know those parapsychologists. I deeply admire what they do. There's a, there's, a real, there's a real split in the conversation but, but between what they call quantitative and qualitative research. And the general consensus is that the quantitative stuff, which is what you're talking about, the laboratory stuff, will produce significant results, but it's very, very small mathematical significance that you can't really see. You can only see in the mathematics. Where the qualitative stuff, which is the stories I've told you, the thing just explodes into the natural world, and you can just see it with your eyes, or you can have the dream. So as a historian, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be a laboratory uh, scientist or a parapsychologist. I'm going to stick to the text and the stories. And I think that's where the stronger evidence is. And I think the reason that something like parapsychology is dismissed is because really where it's pointing is very much away from a kind of strict materialism towards some kind of panpsychism again. And I think people who don't like that don't like parapsychology. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if that's an answer, but, but I, I, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. This will be the final question. OK. I mean, in a large room, much, much larger, almost as big as the big hall today, where an evang evangelical sp speaker then asked us all to stand and, and sing a particular song that everyone knew, because these were people from all over the world. And then he said, and just let your voice raise and speak in tongues. And it was quite extraordinary to have everyone speaking in tongues. And I have always wondered about that. When you said maybe there would be a religious thing with the body of Christ, I assume that that would be an explanation for why you could get a whole room to be in speaking in tongues. Not the same tongue, not their own tongues, tongues they'd never heard of before. Have you looked at that at all? I haven't. I mean, there is there is an anthropology of, of glossolalia, which is what it's called, speaking in tongues. And we know that humans do do it. There's a lot of theories about it. And I, I just don't, honestly, I just don't know the literature. But it's a good, it's a good, your example is a good one of what I was talking about before, the trick of the truth. I mean, this is, a lot of people have commented that seances in the 19th century what seances did when you lower the lights and you sit people around a table is they release people from having to be responsible for their own powers. Uh, and so they'll do things that they otherwise won't do, and they won't even know they're doing it. I think most of this stuff I'm talking about is actually completely unconscious. I, I don't think the person is in control. Joseph clearly wasn't. Um, I think these things are manifesting through this person, but the person as an ego, as a social ego, is, is not, in fact, in control. And I, I would suspect speaking in tongues is something like that. It's a, it's a technique to release responsibility. And, and I don't mean that in a bad sense. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a ritual technique to release the ego from the situation. I don't think we, we are who we think we are. You know, I think we're, we're, we're masks of something much bigger, much larger. And that, that shows itself in these, these extraordinary moments. It, you, you can agree to away with it. I'm, yeah. Do you agree with Teilhard de Chardin that we are evolving into spirit? I, you know, it's certainly what Myers thought. Frederick Myers, the Cambridge classicist who coined telepathy, he believed that these were 
signs of our future evolution. I don't know if I could sign my name to what everything Tehard wrote. Um, I'll just end with a funny story about Tehard. Tehard de Chardin, for those of you who don't know, was a French paleontologist who wrote a lot about evolution and uh, Catholic spirituality. And he really linked it to evolution and to reproduction and to procreation and everything. And when I was in the seminary um, in, the, in the early 80s, I asked our bookstore manager, who was a monk, about Tehard. And he says, oh yeah, Tehard, uh, when his books, his books, by the way, were all banned until he died. Uh, and then they let him publish them. He says, oh yeah, Tehard, when we sold his books in the 60s and 70s like they used to sell pornography in drugstores. <laughs> we, we kept them under the counter and we handed them over in brown paper bags. <laughs> so uh, Tehard's radical. He's a radical dude. And uh, I, I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. But certainly admire what he trusts trying to do. So thank you very much.